Hello everybody, welcome back to the RPG Internazionale. I am as always the Fat Man and I am here with uh, Binary, our mysterious game designer, who <laughs> is not able to show their face today, but uh, is here with a really, really cool mech game that we, have been t that we are going to be talking about today. So why don't you introduce yourself a bit for our watchers that don't know and uh, then we start from there. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, I go by Binary, um, International Designer of Mystery. Um, right now, I'm a designer in the uh, Lumen space, mostly. Um, so uh, based off of uh, Spencer Campbell's Lumen SRD. Um, I've done a lot of work in that space, but I'm fairly flexible and interested in a lot of things. And uh, Apocalypse Frame is the mecha game I've been trying to write for about half a decade, and I'm glad it finally came out. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well. Thank you so much for being here. And Absolutely. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah. And as always, uh, we are here to talk about... In, uh, well, we are usually here to talk about an upcoming game. Actually, today we are here to talk about a game that has uh, recently-ish received an update, but has been out for a while, correct? Yep. So it's been out since last august technically and that was the version 0 0.1 yeah. um i've it's been the one consistently I tried originally <laughs> fair enough um it uh it's perceived updates since um a lot of updates i'm hoping to bring to bring it to a 1.0 soon but it's it's nearly there okay so well Let's uh, introduce you to the project. I am very sorry my Discord keep pinging. I apologize to every watcher. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, let's introduce you to uh, let's introduce us to the project. What you have been designing, what it is, why mech robots, why giant robots punching each other, and what <laughs> flavor of giant robots punching each other is this? Absolutely. So, what do you want to start with first? Uh, I would like to just uh, give us a very, very, very quick overview of the game itself. And then we go a bit on your journey, and then we are going to go back to the mechanics and so on. All right, sounds good. So the game itself, um, the idea behind Apocalypse Frame came initially from kind of a weird angle for Mecha. Um, so initially I was playing Xenoblade Chronicles X, and that was really the big thing that kicked it off, because I was playing that while reading the Lumen SRD for the first time, and that's when the light bulb started going off. The initial version of it in Google Docs is labeled uh, Lumen XCX, even. Like, that's the direction it was initially at. But the more I started designing it, the more I really wanted to bring it to more of like an armored core space. Like, the idea of, like, a lone mech just going as fast as possible, just completely able to destroy everything, as long as they're very good about it. So, that's kind of where it sits right now, um, as far as, like, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. It's It's got that uh, Xenoblade, like, kind of structure to the game, the way it's set up, like, the, the, the setting, the world building, things like that. But the real gameplay, moment-to-moment, -moment, is very armored core. Um, Campaign-wise, it's very XCOM, actually. Um, that's kind of the influence that I felt leaking in and just kind of leaned into it. So gameplay-wise, it's set up to uh, basically pace you as far as like normal missions, harder missions, missions that get you something, things like that. It's got systems to pace you in that direction. So. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the overall overview. So, uh, again, you have mentioned Lumen, you have mentioned uh, that is the space where you create. Uh, I am very curious, how did you get to that space? How did your, uh, I don't know, career as a game designer, if we can call it that, I don't know if this is your main <laughs> career, but like, uh, how did your design journey start and arrive here? Uh, why specifically Lumen? What is interesting to you about it uh, mechanically and so on? Sure. Can you set us up but a bit just about the journey, then we can talk about the destination. Absolutely. So this my journey starts um, probably mid-late 2000s, like playing a 3.5 edition D&D, really, and just like really getting into the homebrewed boards for that, really getting into... Uh, 
just trying to tweak the game to actually work instead of not work. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a common experience with 3.5. I yeah. love it, but <laughs> my god, that does not work. I have a lot of fondness for it, but man, I, I cannot play that again. But <laughs> I just can't do it. But yeah, I have like a lot of fondness for it. <laughs> <laughs> just, anyway. you, get spo- you get spoiled. You really do. But um, beyond that, um, once I discovered 13th Age, I kind of did the same thing to it. Um, that became my main system, like, after discovering it. Um, so I was sanding off some of the edges of that. Um, I am not particularly familiar, I'll admit, so I am also curious. Yeah, no worries. Um, so it's kind of a, kind of halfway between 3rd and 4th edition, but there's a, it's also got a lot of its own stuff. Like, instead of being grid-based, it's, like, locality-based. It's very theater-of-the-mind heavy. It's it's a cool system. I, I liked it enough to re- rewrite all of it, <laughs> but <laughs> we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> that is the greatest form of love for an RPG creator. Exactly. So the other thing that really got me thinking about like making my own things instead of just iterating on various D&Ds was uh, Lunar Reckoning. So this was a mech game that someone made in, I want to say 2010-ish, that for some reason I cottoned to and started talking to the developer and started playtesting with them and really got thinking like, okay, yeah, maybe I could make my own kind of thing. And like for, I don't know how many years, probably like seven years i've kind of had like fits and starts of little projects that didn't really go anywhere and i didn't really show anyone and i kind of bend them because i lost interest that kind of thing so eventually um i got the itch and i decided to carry through with it when I, after i read fragged empire actually so fragged empire is a great game i don't know if you know anything about it vaguely aware of its existence, not uh, in any way knowledgeable about it. That is totally fine. <laughs> so it's it's pretty obscure, but it's good. Um, it's got that same like tactical itch scratching that, uh, you know, 3.5 and et cetera had for like builds and stuff. Yeah. But it's a lot more cleaned up and et cetera. But yeah, that's a sci-fi game. Um, and I read that and my first thought was like, what if I converted this to like Shadowrun? Because I really want, I've run to run Shadowrun forever, but man, getting through that book is something else. So um, my project then became like, okay, what can I do to convert this into Shadowrun? So I made a whole damn book out of that. Can I swear on your book? Yeah, yeah it's thing? Fine. Okay, I, fuck yeah, all right. I am not monet. I am far too small to be monetized, so I do not bend to the whims of the algorithm. I, <laughs> Hell I yeah. have no fear for I have nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> that is totally fair. <laughs> All right. Fuck yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I basically just wrote an entire book of that. And obviously you can't, like, monetize that. So, like, that that lives on my hard drive and among my friends who somehow decided to play that. I don't know why. But, um, yeah, no, for, after that, um, we had started playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition briefly. Like, just when it came out. Just like, okay, yeah, it's a new thing. Let's try it out. And I hated it. I just hated playing it so much. And part of it was that I got used to the Fragged Empire's 3D6 mechanic. So I was thinking, okay. Like, I, re- I like 13th, way- 13th Age a lot. Um, what if I just take, like, a 3D6 mechanic and stick it into 13th Age? What happens? I was- and I tried that, and I was like, okay, yeah, this is pretty cool. But what if I do this? And what if I do this? Anyway, um, I, lo- I ship a Theseus the entire entirety of 13th Age into uh, 36th Way, um, which is 220 pages long and is just 13th Age redone to my liking. Um, it's a lot. Uh, but yeah, when I was finishing that up, I was like, okay, yeah, like, I, I guess I'm a long game designer, you know, 220 pages. Sure, all right. Um, I don't know how I got cottoned on to, like, light which is uh, Spencer Campbell's first game that uh, preceded the Lumen SRD. Light is four pages. Yep. The entirety of like light with all its stuff is 16 pages. And I, st- I read that and I was like, my God, this is, this is probably a better game than my entire 220 page thing. Right. <laughs> like, so I got to the, I got to like really thinking about the Lumen SRD. And like I said, I was playing Cena Blade at the time and I was like, okay, 
I've had a few ideas for mega things over the years. Why don't I try to bring that back with this? This seems like a perfect system for it. So that's kind of what got me where I'm at. Fair. That sounds like a great inspiration, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the uh, overview. Let's do a little bit more of digging into it. So let's talk about uh, uh, the mechanics. Obviously, considering your inspiration, we know more or less what we are going to go into, but uh, what is unique here, because you seem to be particularly talented in the ship of Theseusing, the process of game design. <laughs> So well, thank you. <laughs> what has changed? What bits and pieces have been taken from here and there? What are your core? What's I don't know to use a video game term? What's the core gameplay loop? Uh, that that sort of thing. Absolutely. So let's start with the core gameplay loop. Um, this is very much based on like like I said, a very XCOMish mission structure. Like you have standard missions, you have crisis missions, which are kind of like the terror missions, where like. You know, oh no, something went wrong. You know, yeah. something's going to be hard. Uh, this is where you introduce like new stuff or like really mean stuff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you also have like moonshot missions, which are like, you know, more of that stuff that introduces that horizontal progression, you know, the stuff that really moves things along in a campaign. So that's generally the campaign loop. It's very mission based. Um, as far as the mechanics, uh, Lumen is what it is. Um, in general, some parts I messed with, some parts I didn't. So you still have three attributes. You still roll that many d6s, et cetera, when you're using them. Um, they're, they're the usual ones for slow focus. Um, I mean, mine are named differently, but you know. Yeah. Uh, the big changes I made are, first off, um, in typical Lumen, you just usually have two resources, which are your health resource and your power resource. You know, health is health. And, you know, your power resources, you can use a power with it. Great. What I change is you have three resources. Um, you have Vigor, which is your health. You have Tension, which gives you extra actions. Um, you can get that back pretty easily from drops. And you have Ammo, which gives you, which lets you use your systems, which are like your powers, which are your very reliable things. Um, that Ammo does not come back typically. Like, unless you do, like, special things in a mission. Like, you know, you find a supply drop or something. Okay, yeah. So, the reason I did this, as opposed to Core Lumen, and to be fair, like, the version you, you had said you initially downloaded, 010, actually did not have this split. Yeah, no, um, I was thinking <laughs> back, and that was not what I experienced, but uh, that yeah. sounds also fun. <laughs> yeah, so initially when I was designing it, it was a lot closer to, like, Core Lumen. Um, I actually went away from that method because I was replaying Armored Core uh, for answer. And I was trying to think, like, what really separates light, medium, and heavy mechs? And, like, that was really a thing I was trying to focus on because they just didn't feel right in, like, 010 and 020. Okay. So, really, that split is what came of that. So, like, light mechs are very high on tension and low on everything else. They're very fast. They can they have a lot of flexibility. They, they don't have a lot of, like, heavy weapons ammo. Heavy mechs are the opposite. They can get shot a lot. They have a lot of uh, ammo for, like, heavy weapons and can really just spam that. But they can't really, you know, flex too fast. Yeah. And, like, really that was what spawned that change from the core lumen like me trying to really differentiate light medium and heavy because that really was a core concept because it's, it's max i mean it, it feel weird if like light medium and heavy all kind of felt the same yeah totally totally understood yeah i i, I mean, kind of I'm think a big of it battle as tech guy probably my favorite system of all time is a time of war so i'm <laughs> I, there you I go do strongly believe in like the I don't know, Max having a specific role and Max being weapons of war more than uh, basically fancy toys. I'm more on the um, uh, Max as military weapon than Max as like medieval knights, end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. No, I like to think of like Max in like various genres and configuration as kind of existing on the fighter plane to tank spectrum. Yeah. So that's kind of where I was going with that. Like lights are definitely fighter planes, heavies are definitely tanks, mediums are somewhere in the middle. Gotcha, gotcha, perfect. 
completely understood. And, I mean, that kind of has us covered uh, with uh, our core, like, base concepts. Um, because I, that is usually one of the big discriminants for people, for players, and because not everybody knows Lumen. Uh, what uh, dice you roll, little cards you draw, plays you do, uh, calls you make in yeah. your game, uh, down to the metal, beyond the character sheet. When you want to do something, what do you do? What do you roll? Absolutely. So in general, if you're tr so in general, if you're trying to do like a general action, like yeah. you know, a general roll, you'll take one of your three attributes, which describe approaches to a situation. Yeah. Like your drive attribute is like have a powerful approach. Speed is kind of like a faster reflexive approach and control is like a measured or like smart approach. Yeah. And then you, and you roll pulls out of them, correct? Yep. Yep. You roll that many dice and take the highest one. Uh five or six is a success, three or four is a mixed success, it's a success with a consequence. Yeah. And a one or two is a failure with a consequence. Perfect. Thank you yeah. very much so. in that regard. Yep. Uh, so I, I mean, I meant I just mentioned my love undying for battle tech in spite of its myriad <laughs> of problematic elements and very dubious yeah. lore. And, and, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not like too too familiar with battle tech, but I dipped in a little bit when that video game came out a few years ago, and yeah, I mean, you definitely see a lot good and a lot bad pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of real dumb, but yes. <laughs> uh, um, with that said, obviously that is not the same flavor that is going to be in your game. So I was curious, what are your flavor inspirations, so to speak? What is uh, because I remember reading through that there is definitely, and I don't know if this is uh, ascribing to you my own politics, but there seem to be more of a lefty bend to what you're writing. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're you're kind of a. <laughs> the, the, the premise is that you're uh, running motions from the collective. Yeah, um, you're functionally a Marxist revolution. <laughs> like, that is it's, just the case. So, it's not very subtle. <laughs> tell me a bit about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in general, a lot of that came from me trying to square away, like, Xenoblade Chronicles X's vibe with my own politics. Um, okay. Because if you don't know anything about that game, um, the idea is that you are the last few people from Earth and you've crashed on some alien planet and your colony kind of has to survive. So I was kind of thinking about that and I was thinking I really didn't want to write something about colonization. I just don't really want to go there. <laughs> so I was trying to think, Comprehensively. okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a touchy subject and I didn't love how the game handled it. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So... The, th the thing I really started with there was, okay, like, if you're not colonizing something, okay, maybe you're the ones being colonized. So my initial concept was like, okay, maybe there's like an alien invasion or something. Then I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that's a little too easy. It's a little, it's been a little done. I mean, that's just straight XCOM, ain't it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's, it's XCOM, it's Independence Day, it's any number of things. Like, it's, it's been done. So that's why I came up with kind of this more subtle thing, which very topical to uh, our age, the infection. Um, the idea is that, yeah, there's just kind of alien thing that's just kind of taking root over everywhere and nobody's really got, got it in them to like fix anything, you know? Just kind of have it in my brain that like, especially watching, especially like in 2020, tw early 2021, just no country really doing much to uh, spread, stop the spread of this pandemic for various yeah, reasons. disease that shall not be named. Exactly. The panini. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, just thinking about that and just thinking, like, okay, like, if there was, like, an alien invasion like this, Earth governments wouldn't do shit. They wouldn't do anything. Not until they got, like, cooed, basically. So I just kind of wrote that in as the starting point. You know, from the, from the word go, like, a government with a lot of weapons, which is uh, definitely not America, gets cooed. And that starts the Republic. So, you know, you get this, uh, basically this fascist thing that kind of is a throwback to Roman era. It's, it's not great. It's very bad. 
And, you know, after a while, like, once you get past the initial, oh, shit, the alien invasion, you get to the, oh, wait, it sucks being here. So the idea was that from there, like one factory, a mecha factory, you know, just decided enough of this. We're just going to start our own thing. We can handle this better than they can. And that's kind of the idea behind it. And, you know, like I said, my, my own politics kind of leak, leaks in a bit. But <laughs> I mean, we are, again, we are playing as a walk yeah. as uprising. So, yeah. And like, I'm not trying to make it a game just about that. Like at the end of the day, it's a mecha game. But, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just didn't want it to be some, like, terrible, like, bad premise. Like, I didn't want a mercenary thing. I didn't want anything like that. Yeah, fair. That is one of the big drawbacks I have uh, had with a lot of mecha games, is that basically you're just uh, knights. I mean, yeah. down to Warhammer, straight up having the Imperial Knights. But Warhammer, it's its own level of satire that stopped being satire because of yeah. liking having money. <laughs> But that's a whole bag of geese that I'm not going to wrangle today. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but yeah, no, I am glad that there is uh, mech games that are not just about uh, the players being the knight in shiny armor, but actually fighting for something worth preserving. Yeah, and I tried to build this into like the mechanics a little bit. Like, if you go into like the running the GM section, like. A lot of what you're doing is creating the people around you. Yes. And I wanted that to be an important part of the game because it's not just you. You're not just like you are, you're good pilots, but you wouldn't be anything without support staff. You wouldn't be anything without other pilots who are also helping. Like, and I really did try to emphasize that. Like, that there's, there's not much character creation, and like three quarters of it is just making other people who are not you. <laughs> Actually, also, while we are at it, because you mentioned it. That it was one of the things uh, that I actually kind of liked of a lot of uh, more... Uh, I want to say intelligence, but really is more class-conscious mecha content uh, is the role that the support staff plays uh, and the role that uh, people who are not necessarily in the mech play in those scenarios. So, um, mechanically, how do you feature that in the game? Like, I know that there is a few things, but why don't you explain it a bit to our watchers? Yeah, so mechanically, I actually want to feature it more in the future expansions, because I feel like I didn't do enough with it. But the big thing is that um, it's not just you doing missions, it's also so for a support staff, it's mostly like, it's a part of the core gameplay loop is you checking in. So you have to, like, have a scene with someone yeah. who is not, like, in your party. And with all the support staff, odds are you're going to feature someone who is not, you know, another uh, Top Gun jockey kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's not just about mech pilots. Exactly. Like, and again, like I said, I kind of want to emphasize that more in a later expansion. Yeah. Um, I just didn't really, I was kind of trying to keep a page limit low on this one. So makes sense. But yeah, um, that, so the other thing is you do also... The, the one mechanic that is outside the party is related to other pilots. Um, the big thing is that when you do like a normal mission, you're not the only one getting sent out on a mission. You choose one of three missions and then other people do the other ones. And, you know, they might, they may not do as good a job as you. Maybe they get captured. Maybe they get, you know, yeah. it's just a roll to, roll to resolve them. And that can go either way. So... The idea being that you're not just, like, solipsistic. You have to, like, kind of think about, like, okay, like, what do I not want someone else to be doing? Like, what are the consequences yeah. of, like, them taking that vision rather than me taking that vision? That kind of thing. Uh, makes sense. Um... Sorry, I was uh, for a second receiving a message that uh, I should have not been receiving right now, but did anyway. Don't worry about it. Hey, no worries. Uh, so, um, we have touched a bit on the mechanics, we've touched a bit on the flavor, the history of your game, how it proceeded. I would like, before going kind of more in the more, uh, uh, I guess, personal part of all of this, um, to uh, touch one second on... 
the publication history, how it has been actually making a game, what has been the experience, how did it feel, like, how is selling a game, you know? It's weird, is selling a game, um, to start with that one. It's very weird that someone wants to pay money for uh, something you've made. Um, that is a weird feeling, and it's more or less dulled at this point. You know, I'm, I guess, six months after uh, release, <laughs> so... You know, by, by this time, it's kind of felt a little bit, but I still kind of get that little jump every time I see a sale. Just like, oh, my God, someone else did it. <laughs> but as far as the publication process, um, so I kind of came into this not really knowing a lot about the indie scene. So I just kind of went for it. Um, I was kind of like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to put something up on it. Price it, uh, I don't know, like 10 bucks. We're going to see how it does. And initially it didn't do too well because I had started my Twitter account that day. <laughs> so, you know, it took me a little bit to get, you know, juiced up and figure out what marketing even was. But I mean, eventually... I don't have my stuff figured out yet either. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm still figuring it out. I'm not exactly good at this, but it's the publication has been interesting. Like you pick up a lot of tips looking at other people and like seeing what other people did and things like that. And like, at first I came into this, like thinking I was really going to like spend, you know, spend whatever money I made on art, like just try to get like really good illustrations or something. And like, as time went on, I was thinking like, I don't really need to do that. Like the more I, the more I time that goes on, I'd rather focus on like layout based stuff. Or just, like, making it the best it can without having to, like, spend that extra on, like, custom art or whatever. Like, and, like, that's kind of the ethos I've stuck to at this point. Like, all of my productions are pretty uh, bargain bin. Um, almost every cover I have is based on image, that kind of thing. And, it's like, that's kind what? of Sorry? I lost a stock you. image. Oh, stock image, yeah. Yep. I mean... I am all for financing local artists and trying to support uh, uh, cre other creatives in the TTRPG community, but I'm also very aware that uh, doing so is a privilege reserved for those A, living in the global north, and B, those wealthy among them. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah. Actually affording good art uh, is expensive. Artists need to be paid well. And <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. most of us can't pay well. Yeah, that's the thing. I was looking at the price it would take, because, like, if I was going to do it, I was like, okay, I've got, you know, nine frames, I've got, you know, X amount of enemies, I've got a cover I'd want to do, I've got various filler pieces. It's like, how much would that all cost? And it's like, well, the wait. answer is, <laughs> uh, the answer is about three times as much as I've currently made. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it is what it is. Like, I'd love to be able to ha make enough to uh, pay one <laughs> but you know at the same time like i don't want to like underpay someone on the you know grounds of yeah, exactly. you know i'm up like, yeah like i don't want to be that guy being so. independent is not an excuse to underpay but also being independent means that sometimes you just can't pay people at all pretty much that's that's pretty much it yeah Well, thank you very much for uh, this insight as well. And let's, uh, I don't know, this is what I like to call the spicy portion of the video because this is where <laughs> I usually get people to actually give me their hot takes. But before we go into that, um, I would like, because this project is still ongoing, it's still being developed, I would like if you were to uh, provide me with a roadmap or like an idea of where we are going with uh, uh, the game. With like what is in the future, how it's going to look, uh, at what stage are we of the next edition and so on. Yeah, so it's actually pretty close to final in my opinion. Um, the big last thing I want to do is get an editor. Yeah. You know, I've... I've, I've done the best that I could up to this point, but at this point I need someone else to look at it who's not me. <laughs> so that's pretty much the last thing until I really just lock it in 1.0 final. Um, and it probably won't be final. I, I love to update my games, but as final as I'm going to make it, I think. <laughs> um, beyond that, understood. yeah, beyond that, I really want to 
So Spencer Campbell has this idea of the season pass, which he's done for a few of his games. The idea being that you pay a set rate and then every month you get a little bit of content from it. Um, I kind of want to do that for like the next uh, the next expansion for this. Um, I'm thinking something more focused on, because we've already basically done Republic stuff very hard on the main core book and on the expansion. No. I want to focus on the stuff that's not that. I want to focus on like, you know, the alien wildlife. I want to focus on like the uh, weird asshole er alien hunters, the claw, like things like that. Like just kind of really dig into all those loose ends and provide some like cool little extra mechanics for that kind of thing. Um, so that's pretty much the plan so far. Past that, I'm basically just uh, laying the tracks in front of me as I go. Understood, understood. That makes perfect sense. Uh, well, thank you so much for touching on that as well. So let's uh, kind of uh, bring it in because we are approaching uh, the 30 minutes. Yeah, so we probably need to wrap it soonish. Today I have a bit less time than usual. Sure. So let's touch on a few last things. Is there anything that you would have liked to say to promote your game, to talk about it? Uh, uh, some facets of uh, the development or uh, ideas that uh, we have not talked about uh, and you would like to bring up. Like anything that yeah. you think is important to give a full idea of what you're making. Sure. Um, so one thing I didn't really touch on is like the variety of enemies. And like, I think this really sets it apart from a lot of Lumen games. So you have a standard enemies, which are basically the same as standard enemies in Lumen, um, but you also have Prime, Colossus, and Tyrant enemies. So Prime enemies are basically like bosses. So that's like, you know, you have a big bad Centurion instead of, uh, you know, the standard uh, other Roman flavored troops. Um, so that's basically, so I added some extra mechanics on that. Um, basically that one has two health spars, it gets a wake up attack. It's, it's just a little nastier. Uh, Colossus enemies are my attempt to replicate something like the Spirit of Mother Will from Armored Core. It's like a big, huge battle station. So for a Colossus-type enemies, like it's split into various parts. So a Colossus battleship will be like several point defense lasers, several rail guns, several control centers, that kind of thing. And your battlefield will basically be the enemy. So... That kind of spits apart. Now, tyrant enemies are something from the expansion. Tyrant enemies are my attempt to replace like enemy next from Armored Core. So that is to say, like something that's your equal, something that's finally your match compared to all these, you know, all these standard troops that you mow down easily because it's a Lumen game. So the idea behind a tyrant was kind of looking at like XCOM 2's enemy, like really nasty enemy mechanics. Um, they can respond every time they take harm. They each have special traits. Um, they can interrupt some attacks, like things like that. They are extremely nasty. And this is all stuff I came up with. This is not stuff in Standard Lumen. So this, this is a very good game to look at if uh, you really want to see a Lumen game that's really tried to focus on like what, it, what is there other than Standard enemies. Cool. That's actually quite interesting. Thank you very much for bringing it up. I mean, uh, there was definitely quite a bit on the version I played. Did more things get added since the original version? Uh, yes. So, um... Nope. I need to read them more. <laughs> <laughs> I need... <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, I actually added I the mean, entire expansion. Fair, I've also <laughs> run the, the adventure that you gave me which y'all will see on the channel soon, question oh, great. if I decide to actually edit the thing. But <laughs> Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I will have also a chat specific about that at some point on the channel, but that is in the future at the moment. I don't. I would love to, just let me know. Plan. <laughs> I have a lot to say about that. Oh, but... awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead, so... sorry. I forget what were we talking about. <laughs> uh, we were talking about the wealth of enemies and things that have been oh, added yes. since the last time I played. Yeah, so since the last time you played, um, I released the expansion, Aces High, alongside the core book. It is included with core. If you have the core, you have Aces High. 
You get it for free. Um, that is where all that stuff I've been talking about with that brings in experimental weapons that brings in experimental systems that brings in like, so one of the things I added in there was actually enemy progression. So as crises happen, enemies actually will get stronger as well. So the idea behind that is that it acts, acts as a kind of like automatic balancer for you against your enemies. Like as you're getting more and more powered up and more and more toys, so are they. You know, again, bring back to that XCOM idea. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, give that a give that a look if you haven't yet. Um, you Absolutely. have it if you have core. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for that. So I would like one more, well, actually, I would like two more things from you, but sure. I would like one more thing from you, one more thing from you, which is uh, another usual question that I ask a lot of people. We've talked to people from, uh, well, not really all over the world, but from like four parts of the world and uh, from people from different scenes, different publishers, people who are publishing classically selling fanzines at game stores and people who are going through Kickstarter or Indiegogo and so on. So what has been your publishing reality and what has been your local scene? How has been uh, your experience of playing and of selling your game? Been dictated, well, ultimately, talking about politics, by the material conditions in which you are located yourself. Yeah, so... As you can tell by my accent, I am very much in the global north in the U.S. of A. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, I don't have any of like that local, like I don't have like RPG SEA or I'm not a member of RPG LATAM or any of those. Um, my local scene is basically the Internet because I started doing this during the pandemic. <laughs> so um, what I can say is that mostly I don't want to use Kickstarter or Indiegogo or any of those. I don't like the idea of these big platforms that we've all kind of tidy, tied ourselves to, like these platform economy platforms. Like after a certain point, Kickstarter is kind of your boss. And I don't like that. Um, for the most part, I like the idea of sticking to itch. Um, I've mostly been, I don't, if I do something like crowdfunding again, I'll do an itch funding again. Okay. Um, I did this a little bit. I did this kind of half-heartedly for Apocalypse Frame. Like I, I had the little bar and everything. I just didn't really know what I was doing. But if I were going to do this again, I would just do an itch funding thing or something similar. Like some people have set up their own sites and I'm very inspired by that. You know, like so their own crowdfunding sites on their own personal sites. I might do that because um, I am a web developer. So I can get that set up on my own. Oh, that's dope. Yeah, no, I'm. I love what I've seen on that front. Um, a lot of people are really doing their best to break out of that uh, kind of Kickstarter space, especially after the crypto announcement, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, gonna be honest. Uh, the whole people living Kickstarter over crypto, I totally get it. And if that's what makes you leave, great. But Kickstarter has. Uh, had a tendency in the past of screwing over people in the global south and even in the global north uh, I have horror stories of people from Italy and from Spain getting actually paid by Kickstarter so yeah you know, uh, no that's and, uh, yeah that's the thing like even if it weren't for this crypto thing it's well past time like I'm, if... <laughs> I'm <laughs> if you are in America, it's probably the best way for you to get your money, and I don't want creators to starve, so okay. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, I am past the point of having trusted Kickstarter for a while. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, if you got to get paid, you got to get paid, and I respect that. But I'm in a position where I have a main, I have like a full time job. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to contribute to that if I don't have to. Like, if someone is full time game design, I respect you using Kickstarter, et cetera. But. Eh. If if you're not, then yeah, don't. you can afford I don't know. not to have a boss that is shitty. Why would you? Exactly. Like I already have one boss. I don't want two. Yeah. <laughs> Very understandable. Very understandable. Uh, okay. I mean, I think we are already getting in the spicy shit. But the last question I always ask is, what's your spiciest take about RPG community publishing? Is there such thing as an RPG community? Uh, what is your spiciest thing? Uh, 
the spiciest steak that we can actually upload. I've had a couple of <laughs> people have spicy takes that we could not upload. So please, the spicy steak I can actually load on the channel. I, I promise I won't say anything too spicy for YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think that kind of thing is it. Like, do we have a community? It's like... I feel like we kind of have a community or like a set of like overlapping Venn diagrams. Um, I mean, the the real elephant in the room is that we're all kind of overlapping with Wizards of the Coast and like their whole ecosystem. I mean, um, yeah, we exist in the shadow <laughs> of a giant. Yeah. I mean, I guess my spiciest take is stop giving them money. Just like stop it. Like as a developer, as a, as a player, like as a person, just stop giving them money. They shut, they suck. Don't, We'll give Wizards of the Coast your money. Um, I guess that's not terribly spicy among indies. Uh, what's my spiciest indie take? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Stop giving money to the Dragon game is in and on itself a spicy take. I mean, not really in the communities I frequent. That's also one of the things. Like, what is a spicy take in the communities yeah. I frequent? Is not <laughs> a spicy take in the communities at large? Pretty much. I have been, I have placed myself to be very insular, more than I should probably. So there is chunks that of the community that will never see me. So, yeah, that's the thing. Like communities built around social media. Like I, I struggle to call it a community. Really, like we we all try to like get on each other's level and try to meet meet up with like minded people. But at the end of the day, we're we're kind of creating our own bubbles. And, like, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Like, there are plenty of people I don't want in my bubble. But <laughs> it is kind of a thing. Okay, perfect. Then uh, I guess uh, this is enough. And this has been a pleasure having you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. No problem. And, uh, I don't know, um, keep on uh, fighting with those mechs because... Uh, <laughs> Big Mac RPGs are a bucket of fun, and uh, I mean, I'm a Battletech guy, but I am also uh, in every Mac game guy, so I am glad that there is yeah. one more that I've got to try, and I... uh, for that I thank you, because, you know, ultimately I am trying one day to make this full-time, and that means I'm going to be playing games for a living, and without creators like you, there would be nothing to play. Well, so. thank you. Yeah, that that is one interesting thing. There really just aren't that many mech games in the tabletop space. I, like, I mean, there's a few really big ones, though. Like, Yeah, there are a few big ones. But, like, if you look at, like, it just popular under the mechs tag, I'm number 10. And I know my sales numbers. They're, <laughs> they're, not, number, they're not number 10 kind of numbers. So, like... There just really isn't a whole lot. Like, there's Lancer, obviously. There's, you know, the various Battletech variants. But there just really isn't a lot in the indie mech space. Yeah. And I'd like that to change. Fair. Yeah, we need to see more. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for being here. And uh, please remember to, um, I don't know, I usually do some weird lefty call to action. I don't know. Uh, vote for your leftist party, but remember that uh, voting <laughs> is not the only thing you need to do because voting is a band-aid. Come on. Remember, kids, voting voting isn't praxis. Yeah. And what else? Uh, I don't know. Donate to the votes waiting people. That's probably the good thing you can do today. There you go. <laughs> and buy this game because it's actually great and it's relatively cheap for a game that's like with this replayability value. It's great. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you all and see you next week. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here.